the Executive Director of the Hudson Valley Gateway Chamber of Commerce, and I am thrilled to welcome everybody here for the Kickoff Chambers Art Industry Media Weekend, where we will be highlighting multimedia venues throughout our community. We are in Peekskill's oldest retail building built in 1838 by William Nelson. In the 1850s, Westchester's first telegraph office was located here. In the 1870s, a small theater was erected on the third floor where we sit now, thus the name Dramatic Hall. Thank you, Gabe Arango, for restoring this glorious old building. And also thank you, Gabe, for your wonderful hospitality this morning. This building is also a shining example of what can happen when you combine economic development opportunity with entrepreneurial opportunity. That is what the Chamber's AIM initiative is all about. Opportunities for entrepreneurs resulting in revitalization and growth for our communities. We have a great need to bring new economic development to this region. With the closing of the Indian Point Power Plants in 2020 and 2021, we need to reposition our business focus to attract new, a new business segment to create a vibrant, prosperous business community that benefits all. As Gay Barango, owner and developer of the Dramatic Hall said, success comes with passion and determination. The Chamber is passionate about this initiative, and we are determined, with your support of course, to make our region the multimedia business center of Westchester County. We wouldn't be here today without the support of the businesses who sponsored this event and ongoing initiative. Hudson Hospitality Group, Louis Lanza, <laughs> M&T Bank, Marlin Productions, Marty, the Atrium at Charles Point. Anybody here for Atrium? Um, we have the Hat Factory, of course, Ben Green. <laughs> Alchemy Post Sound, Andrea and Les. The Charles J. Newman Company, Chuck. The Lofts on Main Street and the Peekskill Industrial Development Agency. I know Louis Wendell is here and so is Fran Gibbs. Thank you. We've had a wonderful committee and thank you guys so much for your support of this initiative. I'd also like to take a moment just to acknowledge some special guests and elected officials who are here today in no specific order. I do want to start off with the Chamber's Chairperson of the Board, Jane Solnick. Very Jane. There she is, way back there. Um, we also have the City Manager for the City of Pe Peekskill, uh, Richard Lyons. Uh, past Mayors of the City of Peekskill, uh, Fran Gibbs and Mary Foster. And our city council in, uh, members who are in attendance today uh, are, uh, let's see, uh, Kathy Talbot, Colin Smith, and uh, newly brought to, uh, to, elected to the uh, city council, uh, Patricia Riley. If I missed anybody, I apologize. Oh, Matt Slater, he's the chief of staff for Terrence Murphy, who just walked in. Thank you, Matt. Um, and we really wouldn't be here today if it, was, um, if it wasn't for our board member, chamber board member, Ben Green. Yeah. A few years ago, Ben observed an emerging trend of multimedia businesses opening here. Thus, conversations began, and the result is this AIM initiative. So it is now my pleasure to introduce AIM's visionary, Ben Green. I'm going to take this out of here. It makes it a little easier. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us here this morning for the kickoff of the AIM 18 weekend. And I've been told to keep it short. And for those of you that know me, that's probably the most challenging thing I'm going to do today. <laughs> been to a few of our presentations. Um, I'd like to point out that the fabulous videos that I hope all of you saw, 
uh, as you came in here, were made by uh, our WCC uh, Film School students, Maria de Gregorio and Arbor Molokai. I said that properly, didn't I, Arbor? I got it. <laughs> and it's, uh, thank you. They did such an amazing job, and it's, it's a collaboration between AIM and Pester Community College to help media businesses expose the film to perhaps, you know, in future jobs. So it's a very great program, and one of the many uh, things we're thrilled to be doing with AIM. So the event and the is the outstanding, truly outstanding group. And I have to say that the AIM committee is the A team. Bruce Apar, Maxi Grubner, Peter McKinley, Andrea Bloom, Chuck Newman, and of course, Deb Malone. I've worked with a lot of people and a better, more committed, dedicated group of people. That's why everything's so organized. That's why this is. So thank you all. You guys are incredible. Each and every one of you, amazing. Incredible. So we're fortunate, very fortunate, to have Larry Shearer with us here this morning and his amazing panel. Larry is the co-founder of the New York uh, State Government Relations firm, State and Broadway. His firm represents film and television stakeholders, including the Screen Actors Guild, or SAG, IATSE 52, and that's the union that really makes the films we watch, the grips, all the working folks that, that, that that, uh, and a lot of them living up here in Westchester, an incredible amount living up here in Westchester, um, that make the films that we watch. The Teamsters, Local 817, the Directors Guild of America, the Post New York Alliance, and major film production studio Broadway Stages. Larry was one of the architects of the post-production film tax credit, expansion of the $420 million film and television tax credit, and an integral player in the development of Greenpoint Brooklyn as a media center in New York City. So uh, it's with great pleasure that I call up Larry Shearer, our moderator, to the stage. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Assemblywoman Sandy Galef. <laughs> State Senator Terrence Murphy. Our very own mayor, Andre Rainey. And Director of Operations and Economic Development for the County of Westchester, Joan McDonald. Thank you. And thank you, Ben. I, I tell you, I, I, I told my parents there would be people here today. <laughs> and they still didn't show. Uh, before we begin, I do want to put out a few more thank yous. First, I want to thank Deb Malone. Uh, from the Hudson Valley Gateway Chamber. She is awesome. I want to thank uh, Peter McKinley uh, from PAC Creative. Peter's helped me with the slides and has tried to make me look good. We'll see how that turns out, Peter. Uh, Heather Bowler from my office has been fantastic. Uh, Chuck Newman, who brought me to Peak Skill. Thank you, Chuck. Without you, I neither live here nor no work here, um, <laughs> so you have brought me here. And uh, Maxi Grabner from Studio Six, Les Bloom, who has done the, the sound for us, and uh, last but not least, Ben Green, who is a foursome nature, folks. Most, many of you know him, but what was supposed to be a 30-minute conversation turned out to be a three-hour conversation. And the next thing I know, here I am. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just line out and sequence the event a little bit. First, I'm going to quickly give some bios for our distinguished guests who are on the panel. Then what we're going to do is I'm going to try to go very quickly through some of the metrics uh, in regards to the economic activity of multimedia. It's a little bit dry, which is why I'm going to try to do it really, really quickly. And then after we uh, finish that, we'll go into a question and answer period. And if we have some time, and I'm assuming we'll have some time, uh, we can take some questions from the audience. So that's, that's the basic construct. Let me start with Sandy Galef, Assemblywoman Sandy Galef. Thank you for being here. Uh, the Assemblywoman uh, was a second grade teacher in Virginia. She taught math and science there. Uh, she has been a consistent fighter up in Albany for uh, the arts and cultural industries. She has been a major supporter of the economic activity of Peekskill, 
and we are very pleased to have you here. Uh, Dr. Terrence Murphy, or Senator Murphy, is a lifelong resident of the Hudson Valley and a deep -rooted, has a deep-rooted commitment to public service. Uh, he was on the Yorktown uh, board in 2009. He was re-elected <coughs> in 2013. Um, I'm just going to make a personal note. Uh, uh, Senator Murphy has been a leader in the state on dealing with the issue of opioid addiction and has traveled widely throughout the state um, in his endeavor to try to combat this plague upon our country and our state. Thank you, Tara. Uh, on the mayor, Mayor Andre Noodle Rainey, yeah. <laughs> is a dedicated father to his son, Zylon, and, uh, and a native of Peekskill. Uh, he brings an understanding of the arts and small business. Uh, he is uh, very, uh, very invested in economic development. And uh, in our conversations in prelude, to, um, in prelude to this event, has consistently talked about how economic development and how the community at large here in Peekskill can participate in a fashion that everybody, everybody wins. And so thank you for being here, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Joan McDonald <laughs> is the Director of Operations for Westchester County for Executive County, uh, 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 County Executive George Latimer. Uh, she is a former commissioner of the New York State Department of Transportation, former commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development. The list of accomplishments goes on and on and on and on. She is just very, very impressive. She holds a MS in Public Administration from Harvard University, and we are thankful that you are on the panel with us. Today. So what we'd like to do is start with a quick primer on multimedia and basically give you guys a sense as to the economic activity that is generated by multimedia. So just as a basic baseline kind of understanding, the National Endowment for the Arts and the US Bureau of Economic Analysts came up with a study in 2013 that basically stood for the proposition that there is $704 billion in economic activity that occurs from the, from the cultural communities. And that includes multimedia. But if we go to the next slide, you can also see that there is a national and international aspect to the cultural and creative industries. All the, all the continents are seeking to grab it. And part of the reason for that is because of the voracious appetite that uh, the public now has for original content. And that original content could be anything from a movie being made. It could be different ways in which uh, you teach kids economics. And uh, let's, yeah, let's just move $620 billion in revenue to North America, 3.3% of the regional GDP. There are some statistics that show that even higher, some statistics that show it as a larger growth or economic uh, driver than tourism. And I, wa I wanted you to just see that when we talk about multimedia, it's an elastic definition to it, but you should know that it could include broadcasting, it could include, bring that back for a second. Sorry. Motion picture and video, publishing, arts, cultural, retail, performing arts, advertising, but that's simply some basic categories. Any industry or any company that uses the internet potentially is considered part of the multimedia community. Next. Um, $869 billion from copyright intensive uh, industries, so film is always copyrighted, books are po copyrighted. There's a lot of different intellectual properties that are, cop that are intellectual property and are copyrighted, and those are the way we protect these industries. It's huge, and it suggests that there are complicated and complex legal parameters on protecting these kinds of cultural and creative industries as well. Next. And so we said at the prelude, what is multimedia? And I said, who knows, really, right? It's a very broad kind of uh, definitionally broad, uh, broad concept. So it's the integration of text, audio, graphic, videos. But go to the next slide. <clears throat> the most important thing that skill now has what we consider five businesses and the multimedia community. So skill has huge dent in regards to attracting multimedia companies. And the question we ask next, 
is to Mayor Rainey, why Peekskill? I think that's a great question. Because you're the new mayor. Because <laughs> I'm the new mayor, that's the best answer. I like <laughs> Terrence. <laughs> But Peekskill has the resources for multimedia. Peekskill has the talent. Peekskill has the creativity. Peekskill has the development for multimedia. When we look at the, what, what he just described multimedia as with all of the different elements of it, we look at Peekskill. I mean, we're from the city. There's so much to offer here. And my personal opinion on it especially is Peekskill has so much potential. I don't want Peekskill to be another one of those cities where we always say we have the potential, but let's show that potential. Let's bring this to Peekskill. And with the arts community, you can't go wrong. You cannot go wrong. So we support this initiative. I'm proud to be a part of it. I'm glad I'm the mayor while we brought this up. <laughs> but I'm proud of what this is gonna do for our people, for our youth, for our future. You know, the creativity behind the arts is, is beyond measurable. And as an artist myself, when I look at these type of initiatives, it just inspires me to do more. It inspires us to put more in the city that are going to reflect how we are, what we do, you know, the film industry. We already have a film festival here. This is just enhancing the vision that was already created years ago. So I think that this is going to be beneficial to the entire community as a whole. Um, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me direct the question to, um, there are three kind of categories that tend to attract multimedia companies or the cultural and creative industries, as mm -hmm. we say. One is real estate, two is transportation, and three is often proximity to a major market. Manhattan, New York City is a major market. Is there something specific to peak skill yeah. that makes it that magnet for multimedia companies? Yeah. Senator Murphy? Yeah, absolutely. It's anything in business, the first thing you get involved in, it's location, 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 right? You're literally 26 miles right outside New York City. Mm -hmm. You have an up and coming area around here. Peekskill has been on the leading, if not on the cutting edge with the studios, the art studios that they've had uh, in place here where they actually have the artists living there. You have the millennials that can't live in New York City because it's too expensive so they come out of New York City, this is the perfect location. You have the revitalization, I'm not sure if he's here, but there's a gentleman, Lou Lanza, that has been taken. He's right there. Oh. <laughs> oh, there you are, hey Lou, keep it up, Lou. <laughs> keep it up. The, you know, who's, who's invested in this community with, with the restaurants and with trying to do the right thing and put peak skill literally back on the map, you can take a train back and forth to the city. You talk about a, a metropolitan area, you talk about a location, you talk about an eclectic group. You have uh, Alchemy that uh, I, was, I was happy to visit uh, last year. That, I, I mean, that, the production that they do there goes on to the movies that we watch on TV or in the movie theater. That's right here in Peekskill. Mm -hmm. I never knew about that. So it's time to spread the word and actually get it out. But this is, you talk about location, location, location. This is the place. And, and that's, it, the, the one question I guess I, 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 I struggle with, although I think I have a sense of it, is peak skill is, as the senator provided, very close to Manhattan and has great transportation. There's also another issue of, where does human capital come in? And I'll throw this over to uh, Joan McDonald to. Sure, uh, you know, as you mentioned, Larry, I did uh, community and economic development in uh, the state of Connecticut. And when, when people generally think of eco uh, economic development, they almost focus totally on what incentive does this company get? What incentive does that company get? And what is more important, what I heard from businesses, large and small, and I see it right here in Peekskill, is the human capital. Uh, because a company can't grow if they don't have the right human resources and the right talent uh, to do the work that they wanna do. And you know, right here in Westchester County, we are one of the most educated workforces in the nation. Uh, we have colleges, our community college. One of the great things about uh, uh, the, the film and technical industry is, is 
targeting those courses that can help uh, the individual companies grow. And that's what we're committed to doing, working with our uh, community college uh, and our colleges and universities. All right, and I'm gonna ask Assemblywoman Galef if she has any thoughts on the human capital component because uh, clearly you can have a industries in a, in a community, but if you don't have the people to actually work in that industry or you don't have the kind of education and interface between those industries and those people, you got to disconnect. Right. Well, Joan said it so well. I mean, Westchester County, um, with all the reports, say we are a highly intelligent county. I think that that's a good thing. Uh, <clears throat> and I know my district is highly intelligent, uh, which is also a good thing. Um, but, you know, it's, it, and, but, but I think because of having New York City so close to us, maybe that has made us more interested in the arts um, as opposed to, my family was from kind of rural Indiana, and I don't think that would have happened there. Um, we're kind of conditioned to go into the city, whether it's museums, whether it's Broadway shows, uh, whether, you know, movies or whatever, and then it's all kind of come out here. So, you know, Peak Seal has been the site for a lot of movie productions. I am amazed that there are 75 companies here in this community involved in media. Um, I was so glad I was asked to be on the panel because I had to learn all about this, which, which I, you know, again, I don't think we're tooting our horn loud enough. Um, and the fact that people have come here to set up those companies, say that there is human potential here, there are people interested in the arts. Uh, we spoke a little bit earlier as we were off stage uh, about the whole issue with Indian Point and the loss of over a thousand employees when the plant is closed, you know, are these people that would be able to transition for those that aren't going to follow along with, with Entergy, can they transition into some opportunities here, um, whether it's small business or, or the very technical side or uh, the money side, the accountant side? Um, you know, I, I think we have to really work on that um, and try to get people into this area. Um, we have kids in this community. This community has so many talented young people. When I go to the high school to events, I am totally, you know, I, I just can't believe their, their talents that they have. And so connecting them, and this may be another question, but connecting them from the schools into our industries right here, you know, doing that internship program, having those early jobs for people that are leaving school, those are the, the humans that we can transist right into this area. And, um, you know, I think that would be great. I'm just, I'm thinking on a very small term about uh, the Burns, Jacob Burns um, Center, Film Center in Pleasantville, and they have connected with the Austin Children's Center daycare kids, mm -hmm. daycare kids to come in and learn about film. Well, this should happen in every one of these 75 uh, facilities so that we get more and more people uh, directed into media. And it's a media center right now. It was an art center when Fran Gibbs was mayor. I mean, it's, Peace Hill has just, you know, it, it doesn't happen, I'm sorry, with the mayor. <laughs> no, <laughs> right no. then, it, as you said, it's it's been growing and growing and growing, and it's just right at such a pivotal spot and such a good spot, and I think all good things are coming to Peekskill. Um, nothing else but good things. I just want to, can I just piggyback on top sure. of that? Because when you, you touched the thing, the, the kids and the daycare, that's, uh, that's very important too. I mean, technology is advancing, and to know that we can have a multimedia hub right here in Peekskill, it's very necessary, and I, I, I want to jump on that because I have a four-year-old son that can use my iPhone almost as good as me. I mean, he literally texts, when he has his mother's phone, he'll text his name because he knows, he knows how to spell his name. He'll text his name from her phone to mine with little emojis of hearts and <laughs> motorcycles and random stuff. But they're picking up on technology at early ages, so it's important that, that we can actually bring that here now because it's going to benefit us, it's going to benefit business, and of course, it's going to benefit the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, two other quick things on, uh, is uh, you know, the economy is no longer a nine to five economy. 
It is a 24-7 economy. And number two, another important statistic is nationally, 34% of the workforce works remotely, either full-time or part-time. So they are hooked into uh, you know, a company in Los Angeles, a company in New York City. And having, you know, as the senator said, the ability to get into Manhattan in an hour on, on Metro North. So it's having that organic growth um, and the facilities and the businesses that are right here in Peekskill that, that help uh, uh, those individuals that, that work uh, non-traditional hours and that want to, that need to go into the city one or two days a week or one or two days a month, but want to be here in the, um, in the creative community that I think are really important. And I want to just let the Senator, because I think you had a comment that you wanted to make about this particular area of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. On, on the governmental side, you know, the, the, the film tax credit that, that New York State has, has brought it into New York State and uh, the ability for people to come in and actually... <laughs> Sorry about that. You're, you're on, you're on that. Moderator should know that. It was, it was, it was me. Day. You never sleep. But, but, but to, to get to Joan's point is that, is that when you have a well-rounded economic plan here, you have people that are living in the community, people that are working in the community, people need to eat in the community, people need to go out. We had the local waterfront revitalization program that was very instrumental in getting the whole, the whole walkway down on the waterfront right there to revitalize that. So when you work collaborative, collaboratively together, you can get a lot of stuff done, whether it's with the state government, the county government, your local government, that's having an open ear, that's being open to suggestions, but also you got to have people that are willing to take the risk, and you have people that are willing to take the risk right here in Peekskill and make this the place that it's up and coming. So. I kind of want to follow up on the policy piece that the senator brought up, because uh, the film and television tax incentive is uh, very close to my heart, mm -hmm. and um, we would suggest that. Because of that tax incentive, the film and television community has expanded exponentially, both in New York and in the city. Uh, but it also has had a, um, an effect of creating a technology center in New York, which has spilled out to Peekskill and to other areas. So was there a policy piece that Peekskill, because I, I still want to drill down a little bit on, uh, to the initial question of why Peekskill. I get the proximity to New York. I think we get the transportation and the competitive real estate, but there are other municipalities that have that as well. Is there some policy piece that kind of primed the pump early on, and maybe the mayor, maybe you might want to speak to that, but is there something that happened that was unique to peak skill that brought in an artist community? I think it, I think it was the leaders of the city council during that period of time. Fran would probably be the best person to answer the questions. But, because um, I was on the county board, I believe, during that period of time, and um, there were significant um, help with some housing, actually, to put them into community. Is, there was some community housing and some, um, so that artists, who didn't have a lot of money were able to live in this community and there was revamping of some of the buildings during that period of time which added a lot of character I think to to the community and the Paramount Center also was at that point a very key contributor to that um, and um, we didn't have as many restaurants, Louis, but, but they were restaurants. Um, and, you know, all of that pulling people up, up here and then having the artists' weekends where you would go into the studios and, and, and examine people's art and potentially buy it or just find out who the artists were. And that's been going on for, I'd say, probably since the early 90s. Uh, maybe, and so how did that, it, I really think it, it, you don't have something just happen if your government is not interested in it. I think it's really hard for people to say, oh, I'm just going to go up and I'm going to find a, a lower cost apartment and I'm going to be an artist. You, you've got to have, the government's got to be involved with this. And at that point, it was the city uh, officials as well as the county 
being very interested in it. And I don't really know during that period of time whether there were state monies, but there probably were some somewhere in all of this. But, you know, it's, it, it's important who you elect on these issues. And the film and, and TV tax credit, you have to have state legislators who want to do that. It's a tough, it's, it's really a tough position in some instances to say, well, we're not gonna put quite as much money into education because we're trying to get people in for industry and to get jobs here, and the jobs that are coming in are gonna help everybody else with employment, whether you know it's restaurants or the ancillary um, uh, things that come along with, with film and TV production. But, but it is who's there making the decisions. It makes a difference, and a lot of times people don't realize that who they elect on various issues will impact their lives. Right. And, and Peace Hill's been very supportive all the way through, I'd say. And I, and I think that probably goes to the acquisition of these kinds of companies because there was already a fertile type of environment, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? So I, I, there was a policy component to it. Um, and maybe that policy component just simply got lucky because then later on down the road, we had a mm -hmm. film and television tax incentive in. Mm -hmm. We built that a larger community. But now that Peekskill is on the rise, and Peekskill has retained uh, a fair number of multimedia companies, the next question goes to how does Peekskill maintain and how does Peekskill retain those multimedia type companies? John, do you want to take a shot at that? Sure, I think, I think what we've been hearing from everybody up here in the panel is that it, it's, uh, it's really, no one entity. You know, government can't do it alone. The businesses can't do it alone. The not-for-profit sector can't do it alone. So it's a combination of uh, of all of them coming together. Uh, we, we've touched on the human resources, the human infrastructure. We've we've touched on the capital infrastructure, and um, you know I, I think what we're seeing across the country is is cities are back, and in some instances when it's a uh, a Cleveland where Quicken Loan puts their headquarters and puts a lot of uh, uh, private investment in. Peekskill, it's the, uh, it, is, it, is the, it is this collaboration of the creative class and how to, to grow that. And it is making sure that the dialogue continues. And as, as Sandy just said, if, if <clears throat> collectively uh, the mayor, the businesses see that something is needed from a legislative standpoint, that that communication remains open uh, so that uh, from the state legislative side, from the county legislative side, those things can be addressed. Um, I did want to touch on, we, we talk a lot about the film tax credit, but there are other uh, financial ways the county can assist businesses. Uh, the county has an industrial development authority and a local development authority for not-for-profits where we can offer sales tax exemptions for machinery and equipment purchases and low interest loans for, for building expansion. And um, we need to have those conversations in a much more proactive way, which the county executive is committed to doing to make sure that, that businesses that are small are aware of these, uh, these programs that are available to them. So uh, I think we, we all have to, to work together to focus on those. Right, and that, that kind of, uh, <clears throat> that's kind of one side of the coin where there is public policy that could generate uh, attraction and, and retention of these type of companies. There's also uh, a theory that to some extent, once you do the seed, the seeding of these the companies, that kind of government needs to take a back seat. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Senator, if you want to, if I'm going right yeah. at you, but yeah, I'm no, going to no, ask you if you want to talk I, to I, that. I, I'm all in on that one. So, you, 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 you know, it's, it's the delicate balance. It is the delicate balance of having government involved and then having people that have want to take the risk and get into the field that they want to go and they're going to jump in. But giving them uh, not so much uh, a 10-foot pool, but maybe a three-foot pool where they can kind of swim around a little bit and if they need to, they can stand up and someone's going to be there to help them. We're not going to open the door up and have people come in and drown. That's not what this is all about. This is to try and make sure that people succeed and when 
they succeed, the community succeeds. And when a community succeeds, the state succeeds because of the tax revenue that they bring in, the sales tax revenue that they bring them, the, the, the going into the restaurants, going into the different, uh, you know, eclectic uh, shops around here, getting them affordable housing in the, in the area right here. It, it, it's a multitude of different things. And to, to your point, it is a delicate balance, but you've got to give them the opportunity to want to come. Our millennials nowadays, most of them, they don't want a car. For whatever reason, they don't want a car. They want to stay right here and jump on the train, shoot down to the city, go, go get on the subway, go to work, come back up here, or wherever, wherever it happens to be. To me, that was that's just another whole, I still can't wrap my head around it. But that's happening. That's happening. That's, that's how you got to revolve. So when you get stuck in one little box, that's usually where you succeed for a little bit of time, and then it kind of peels off. We don't want it to peel off. That's why you got to keep evolving it. Keep making sure you bring, you keep people step outside the box. Make sure that they have the ability <laughs> or the technology. I've just been staring at your 5G up there. Mm -hmm. Senator Amador talked to me about the first time, and this is an initiative of what the state's trying to do, is have faster broadband. And that will help some of these people that actually want to come in. And if we get it here, this could be another hub of where we're going to have more people wanting to come. Right, and I, I second what he's saying, but just on behalf of the millennials, we like driving too, Terrence. Come on now. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know you were a millennial. Yeah. <laughs> So, but for the most part, I really see like, you know, the, this is actually a vision that not only the artists see, but the council sees, the government sees, the community sees, the businesses see. This is not just an idea that just came up and, you know, it does, it's, not, it's not relevant to everyone here. Everybody can play a part in the artist media, in the artist industry. And I think that that's what makes this so powerful. There's so many things that people are trying to do and, you know, accomplishments people are trying to achieve. But when you talk about multimedia, everybody can play a role in it. And I think that's what makes this so powerful. And like she said, you have to get people to buy in. You have to get people to want right. to be a part of it. Yeah. And everybody, so at least as far as I know, everybody wants to be involved in the multimedia. So, so let's, let's assume for, for the sake of this discussion that Peekskill is a very special place because Peekskill, <laughs> unlike a lot of other municipalities, is already on that arc and it's an upward arc in attracting multimedia companies. Mm -hmm. What what are the basic needs of a community? What would they require, those multimedia companies require to thrive here? And then let's go to mm. the human capital back. We'll go back to the human capital. But I'm looking at the we, future of broadband. broadband. I'm looking at the integration of services. And I'm saying, what do they need? Mm -hmm. You want to talk Could to I that comment? Assembly? Yeah, just about the broadband. Um, I actually think Peaksville is probably in a pretty good spot um, with broadband, but that doesn't mean that Peaksville will be in the future because we're doing. I was thinking the other day, our our driverless cars, don't they need? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they need communication. Um, our smart meters, <laughs> Jane from Con Edison. Our smart meters, we're going to need more of that, and all the different apps, everything you know that all the millennials need, we're going to have to grow. Why does everybody look at the mayor? So, <laughs> What's that I don't about? know. I mean, I'm on God my phone, them. too. <laughs> Wish I was but there. anyway, no, so, uh, but one of the issues that we're facing in our budget this year right now, which probably we're going to be putting aside, and, and Terrence kind of uh, alluded to it, um, the issue um, with uh, cell towers or small cells within communities that would be positioned on utility poles. Um, and that would, I mean, I, I can't tell you in my district how many people are opposing. I've got two cell towers being opposed right now in my district. Um, and we have gotten all these memos, which I have in my folder here from mayors saying, we don't, we want control over this. We don't want you to do this. We don't want the small t cell cell um, towers units on our utility poles. So. You know, we're going to have to have a real discussion about this, what we are willing to do as, as human beings in our communities. Are we doing something that there is a health impact? I don't think we are, but, but you know, there are people that say that there are. Uh, how much more do we need to have so we can bring in more and more companies? Every company that comes in is, is using 
using more of our assets uh, as we go along or if a new company comes in that wants to do more. We, we've got to position ourselves um, so that we have a good broadband system throughout the state. And we know upstate, they really don't have it. But there's some areas right around here, um, you know, Putnam Valley, Phillipstown, Yorktown, I think, even in where I shop for food in, in Austin Briarcliff. As soon as you get to that shopping center, you have, you know, everything goes off. So um, we have pockets around here that, that would not work. Uh, but I think Peaksill really has to look at that and what the community will do and what we will be doing on a, on a state level. Uh, the federal level is taking care of cell towers. You basically have to fight the federal level on, on those if you want to. But, but these new units will be more of a local issue. Well, I'm going to throw it to Joan, but before I do, there is a balance that has to, I, I would suggest, has to occur to provide the technological infrastructure for these kind of companies. And Joan, if you want to talk to where the county sure. is and where you, your thoughts <clears throat> on it. A uh, couple things. Uh, before I came back uh, into government, I was doing some consulting and one of my projects was working with the Westchester County Association and the four cities in uh, Southern Westchester on bringing broadband capability, particularly to low income areas. And let me pick up on a point that Sandy made about the, uh, she didn't call it this, but, but basically the nimbyism. And let me be clear, we are in fierce competition with other cities across this country where it is much easier for technology to come in. I, was, uh, I participated in a conference in Kansas City uh, in August of last year where Google Fiber came in, and they, they're, they're, they're just going uh, full speed ahead, and everybody is going to have 5G quickly. And one of the reasons it's going quickly is because Kansas City doesn't have uh, the zoning and land use restrictions that we have here in New York State. Now, I'm a strong advocate for home rule, um, but everybody has to recognize, as several of us have been saying, that there is a balance to be had. And um, you know, Kansas City, Cincinnati, uh, Chattanooga, they are all making huge investments. And they are, when you talk to a utility in the um, internet side of the house, the barriers to entry will either make it easy or difficult for us to be competitive. And that, that's, the, that's the accessibility issue. The other issue is the, affordable, the affordability issue. And um, those of us in this room, many of us in this room, um, the affordability issue is not an issue. But if we do not address that affordability issue, and the Federal Reserve Bank right now has a, a major initiative underway by using community, whereby banks can use community reinvestment uh, uh, credits to make investments in infrastructure so that, that uh, kids who can't afford a tablet get a tablet. So that uh, community centers where uh, broadband is slow in neighborhoods are open till midnight so that parents uh, can go there and, and come up to speed. And I, mm. it, it, is, it, it is not the future, it is today. At that same conference, um, we were staying at a Marriott and two women uh, in their early 30s came in uh, on a bus with their two children to, and asked for an application to apply for jobs at the Marriott. And the woman behind the desk manager said, we don't do any more paper applications. All of our applications right, yeah. for hourly wage jobs are done online. Mm -hmm. And it was a slow time of the day, so she took these two women down to the business center and instructed them and walked them through the application process. But if we do not address the issues so that people who don't have the things that we accept, that we take for granted, we are leaving a huge part of our population behind and a population that could fill these jobs that you all have. And it's something that we have to stay focused on both from the private sector and the public sector. And, and, and to that point, because I think that's a, a, a point that I hear often from my clients where they say that Atlanta has become a film and television hub because of all of their building and infrastructure. So there's a movable feast quality to these types of industries. And it kind of brings me to a conversation that I had with the senator 
uh, a little while back, where we spoke about what kind of infrastructure, not just multimedia, but any municipality would need. So we do have an integration of services construct here. Is there, Senator, is there a, are there support services that are required by these industries and the general population that for peak skill to stay on the cutting edge needs to engage? <clears throat> well, that's a great question. It kind of dovetail into what Joan was talking about, just to add a little bit to that, is that um, the rules and regulations in New York State are absolutely so onerous, it's incredible. Yes, do we need some? But some of them, I used to chair for two years the rules and regulations for New York State. I'm about six foot two. I took a symbolic picture that had books, 180 degrees around me, with regards to over 170,000 pages on both sides of the rules and regulations. So if I don't like you or the business that you're gonna start up, I can go back to 1920 and shut you down or keep you in court. And this is the reason why we're ranked 49th in America as a business-friendly state, part of it. That's gonna change, that has to change in order for us to draw more businesses in here, into New York State. This is part of what we're, this is, a, absolutely. This is. And, and, but if I can ask you to, I wanna focus a little bit. Everybody needs their garbage taken out. It doesn't matter whether you're a multimedia company or you're you know, a, a, a restaurant or what have you. You need those kinds of services. There are gonna be certain services, I assume, in the future that are going to incentivize folks to come to a municipality. And, and many of them are gonna be internet-based. What are those services? What are those kinds of constructs that Peekskill can start to think through as a visionary municipality so that it becomes a, um, it, it, it does not lose its edge, so to speak, in attracting these kinds of, these kinds of businesses. Does anybody want to take a stab at that? Because telehealth and things of that nature that we had spoken. Yeah. So, so th that's already starting to happen right now. You have Westchester Medical Center that um, has taken over St. Francis Hospital up in, in Dutchess County. Mm -hmm. And um, what they're doing now is they're trying to, they have telehealth. So they have doctors that are actually sitting there watching the monitor in Westchester monitoring a, pa a patient up at St. Francis. Now this patient is in the room, they're hooked up to the monitors so they can see if their blood pressure's dropping, they can see if the heart rate, if the person goes into an arrhythmia or the person codes or anything like that. So you'll be able to have um, an extra eye, so to speak, on the patient, but also it's a little, I, I, I'm a little cautious about it too because, you know, if that person does code and you have, we have a, we have a bill, a safe staffing bill that for the nurses that in ICU that um, the, the, the nurses, I'm gonna give you an example, there's, there's four people in ICU here, four people in ICU there, there's two nurses, if one codes, this nurse has to go on it, this nurse turns around and, and gets is now on seven different, uh, keeping her eye on seven different patients. So if you're gonna go to telehealth, you're gonna you, be cautious, but it is being done already. And it's absolutely incredible. I went down to the facility in Westchester Medical Center and, and the monitors and, and what they're doing down there is really cutting edge. But that's opening up the door. That's allowing you know, new technology to be brought in. That's with the government working with them, making sure that they have the ability to do it. I don't know if anybody has seen it. There's a massive uh, a renovation going on down at, the, down at the center down there. And uh, so they're really kind of staying on the cutting edge of this. And, and, and I'm gonna, and I think that's interest, important, those services, um, and however they play out, right? Peak Skill probably wants to stay on the cutting edge. And I'm gonna address the next question, though, to our millennial. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> to the mayor. To um, the mayor. <laughs> there's also gonna be a need for housing. Right. Where does, what's the role of the city in regards to, yeah, in regards to right. housing and in regards to uh, ensuring that the folks who are in Peekskill have a, a, a good place to live and a pipeline into these kind of industries? Right, well, how, for, first of all, housing's always been um, uh, an issue uh, or a challenge that different municipalities have faced. 
um, but working towards um, creating more opportunity is what the ideal goal is. And also, like, if you look just next door to this building we're in right now, we have brand new artist lofts where they offer incentives for, act for people who are actually artists. I mean, you can live in one of these lofts for as low as $800 a month just by being a registered artist in the city. So that promotes, you know, that, that makes, it, uh, makes it exciting for artists to want to come here. And as we're working towards this, you know, artist media hub, artists have a place to live, they have a place to work, and they have a place to raise their families, you know. So it, it, we have all of the elements necessary to make it successful for any artists that are, you know, looking for a place to go, looking for a place to work, or looking for a place to actually live, or even looking for a place to visit. But, you know, again, what we said earlier is, is you know, we have things in our, in our um, policies where we offer to, when developers come in, they give to parks and recreation, for example. You know, going forward as technology, technology improves and advances, we can look towards doing things where developers give to our artist community. Developers give to our artist boards or, you know, things like that. Like, we can actually create things as things come that'll benefit the entire community, especially the artist community, for the millennials especially. <laughs> Could I? Sure. I, know <laughs> um, I think a community, and sometimes this goes back to what the people in the community think, you have to have a balance of higher end housing, middle income housing, and lower, lower income housing. You, you have to have a real mix. And often in communities, um, lately I've seen people fighting those categories in, within the community. And, and we can't, because we have to know that uh, when you have a business here, you've got people, that, people are often driven about where they can live with, if they want to live in the community where they work, can they get the housing that they want? So you have to be sure that that's there. Otherwise, they might go back to Brooklyn or whatever else, um, this industry, which is so important there. But I also think that um, you've got to have housing for incubators for other businesses that aren't here now. Mm -hmm. But somebody's got a great idea. Um, come up and, you know, we have to do more and more of that. Um, I, was, I, I haven't seen downstairs, but I think that that's, that's wonderful on the second level here. Um, but, but we need to probably do more of that so we can get people to start in and network and, and whatever else, even more than it is today. And of course, the education in our schools. I mean, this is, why do people come here? Why do they stay here? They've got to see that they've got either employees coming from the schools or their children are in the schools. And so that's a really, really important part of all of this. Is there a government role, whether on the state, county, yes. or local level, to, uh, to, to provide either funding or otherwise, Absolutely. for there to be an interface between multimedia companies and the existing community that has not been a participant necessarily in these kinds of businesses. Is there a way to do that? Well, to you're boost? asking two different questions. I, I want to go back to what does the state do? Right now we're fighting for foundation aid for the school districts uh, that have greater need, and that will help uh, to bring up the standard for all of our kids, the more money that's coming from the state, and that's that's really important. Okay, that's maybe, that part of it. Right, and maybe I wasn't clear enough. Okay. So, in a, a number of different industries, you have uh, skills training type mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. Is there a pipeline construct that the government could be helpful with to bring kids from the high schools in peak skill into this type of workforce? Is there something that the government can do, either on a county, local, or state level? Well, I, th <clears throat> I think knowledge. it's a collaboration of, 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 of communication, of letting the school district know to the community know. Uh, we have a school down at Hawthorne Cedar Knolls. That's a special act school. That um, the kids are sent there from the city. Uh, it's a facility. Uh, that uh, is down there. There's a school district on it. Some of these kids are not going to be able to graduate. But they got, they got skills that they can do with their hands. So we're trying to get an apprenticeship put on the campus. Mm -hmm. So they come out, they're, they're out with a career, and they can go out, build up their self-esteem, and put 50 bucks in their pocket and feel good about themselves versus leaving after school and going back down to New York City. So that's a communication effort amongst the, the government, amongst the community, and amongst the person who's doing the business, the multimedia company. So if you have someone that's coming in from, a, from another state that wants to come in here, Sit down, talk with the mayor, 
This is, this is his turf right down here. He should know who wants, who wants to come in, who doesn't want to come in. Then he reaches out to Sandy or myself saying, listen, is there any tax credits that this guy might be able to get? That's communication. That's how it should work. All right, so there's but it's not all about money. Um, I mean, you have after school programs in the schools, and, and part of it can be um, you know, helping with, with kids to learn about job development and so on. But I have to tell you, you know, in my office, I have these interns that come to my office. They don't get paid. But I train them in the government field. And I, I do it because I, I really believe in it. It's my old teacher coming back in me. Mm -hmm. And they go out and they get jobs in government. Uh, they get jobs in PR. <laughs> um, you know, they get the skills. They go on to do wonderful things. And some of them just are good citizens. And, you know, they've learned about the whole process. But why can't people, every one of these companies, connect and be the, the mentor to one of the kids in, in the high school without money. I mean, there's some kids that have to have money, but some kids just have nothing to do after school and they're not really working. Uh, and get them, I mean, if you can walk to these places, that's the greatest part. Um, and, and just start that mentoring program, the Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or whatever it is, mentoring program. Mentoring program, that's great. And, and, you know, we don't have money for everything. We can't always ask the government for money. Uh, but that's great. And when you get those students, if you've mentored them, when they're out of high school or they go on to college or they go to the community college, whatever, they may be your next employee or they may be your part-time employee as they're going to school. So, you know, we just have to develop that, that really good connect because this is the field of the future. That's and is there a role for the municipality for Peekskill in maybe some youth centers and helping to facilitate those bridges? Yes, of course. I mean, having the space for it is, is, is key. I think um, we all can agree to that, having the space for these activities. But, you know, we were just in conversation um, to give you an idea of what we're looking at. You know, we have, for example, three firehouses here in the city of Peekskill, um, which are all going to be closed down very soon once our central firehouse opens. And, you know, we're looking at ideas of what we can do with these firehouses going forward. And just last night I had a conversation, I don't want to put too much out there, but just last night we had a conversation about, you know, what we can do for the kids or what we can do for the community with these open spaces that we have now, these buildings that we have now. I mean, um, even next door behind City Hall, there's a, there's a space right now, there's a youth borough connected to a firehouse. You know, somebody was saying we should just make it a complete music, music place now, pianos, keyboards, and things like that for the, for the youth to do. The city can provide the space as long as we have it for the, for the, for the needs of, 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 of multimedia, you know. Um, and also the fact that, you know, Mr. Bree Pettis is, is in peak scale now too. Um, and he's, he's definitely bringing a lot to the table that helps. And the city's working with him. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I'm gonna just pivot just a little bit, but I wanna stay with the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have a film studio down in Brooklyn as a client and they told me recently they just purchased $800,000 worth of steel from a facility up in Bingington. And I think, the, but they always look to purchase first in Brooklyn. So my question is, is there a role for the county or the city in helping to facilitate an interface between the existing businesses and the multimedia companies so that maybe some of those existing businesses could be ancillary vendors to the, mm -hmm. to the industries that are moving in? Good, good. You yeah, yeah. A, 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 absolutely. And the, you know, the county through our economic development and IDA groups can absolutely do that. And I, and I'm, I remember, you know, one thing that was done on the transportation side, um, you know, we have Kawasaki in, uh, uh, in, in Yonkers, and there was a major effort for the transportation industry to look at suppliers to Kawasaki when they build railroad cars and many of those suppliers come from other parts of the state. So it's, a, it's, a, it's getting those inventories of companies and the types of companies that the uh, arts and media industry use and pulling it together and making sure that we make those connections. Well, to, to, your, to your point, so um, what we had asked on the opioid issue, a little off track, but kind of to your point, how do we get that message out there? We had asked the town supervisor after each town board meeting is just to say, listen, I just want to let everybody know there's a drug take back box 
at your local police department. If you need to take back any medication, go to your local police department and put a, a simple message like that starts to be, re, you, you say it over and over and people, oh yeah, I got, oh yeah. Now, there's, now they're telling the other person and then telling the other person. Then you can do the social media blitz. And then you can, you know, when you're working, how do I say it? When you're sending the message, whether it's through the government or whether it's word of mouth, it starts to grow, the grassroots start coming and coming about. All right, so there's the issues, and I don't know, Peter, is there another slide here? I, I'm not really looking at them. What policies, all right, I guess we've been kind of talking about that. But um, to the Senator's point, there's, a, there's always the question in regards to whether the community's businesses that exist can participate, right? And obviously, in the film industry, restaurants, hotels, all those folks participate. So there's a, there may be a bridge component that can be thought through here as well. Um, I think, I'm not sure what time it is, but it may be time to take some question and answers from. Hey, Larry, I'm going to have to. I'm, I, ha I have to. I have to go. My son is re receiving his basketball awards at 12:30, <laughs> and I'm only home. Yeah. And we thank you for your participation. <laughs> I'm home for 48 hours, and I'm not messing up. You gotta go. <laughs> All right, Deb. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take about 10, 15 minutes of questions, and um, and then after that we'll just wrap it up. So, Deb, would you like to? I have a question, and I'm sorry, Terrence had to leave because he's involved in the uh, task force from the state level on Indian Point, um, and I do want to mention this is regarding real estate, and I was neglect to mention that we do have a real estate sponsor, Berkshire Hathaway. Home Services, Rivertown's real estate. Sorry, Joe, I did not acknowledge you at first. Uh, but there's a lot of land. I mean, our Peak is a small city, uh, but we have a lot of land surrounding this, um, our city, that will be available for development. And I understand that there will be some type of, um, I guess, a report put out on the development of the available land from Entergy uh, that is not uh, so that can be used and, and um, you know, can you speak more about that? Yeah, sure. All right, because this is important to this whole region. It's a great question. I'll answer it before I leave because we've been intimately involved in this. Um, in our one house budget, we have a tax stabilization fund that we're asking to open up for specifically for Westchester County, more so for uh, Cortland, uh, Buchanan, and uh, Hendrick Hudson School District. We're also asking for a $24 million input on a revolving basis until the closure of Indian Point. In our one house on, on our side, we also have a Work Force Protection Act. So we talked about 1,200 jobs possibly leaving the area, that these people, if Indian Point closes, that they become part of the uh, decommissioning process. So they will be retrained to also do the decommissioning process of this, because the decommissioning process can take uh, quite a few, uh, quite a number of years. So we are trying to make sure that we are not going to walk away, or the government, the governor is not going to get away with what he did here without having some repercussions to it. So in order to have a tax stabilization fund, because we're going to Hendrick Hudson School District is going to be hit immediately with twenty-five million dollars overnight. So what we're trying to do is make sure that that does not happen. As far as the Indian Point um, um, land right there, we have been in negotiations, or I don't want to say negotiations, let me scratch that. We've been in talks with a company that possibly wants to come in and produce energy there. That's about all I can say. I think they came to the local task force meeting that you had here in Peekskill uh, last Thursday. So there's a bunch of different variables. There's a lot of land over there, but I am cautiously optimistic with the decommissioning process that it, uh, we might be able to get one or two pieces, but that land's gonna be tied up for a number of years. So it's our obligation as your legislators to go up there and make sure there's some sort of fund that is opened up and funded, and funded through the state to make sure that the land over there and the houses don't lose their value. 
Could I, um, can I comment? I'm on the, the closure task force also, uh, the Indian Point closure. And um, we had a meeting last Thursday, and the county executive came and um, also said that the county would be helpful in um, helping the community with this. And, but you're, you're talking about the use of properties, for not this, so much for the this tax initiative. stuff. In, in right. Having the state and encourage companies to come in under this initiative with the available right. properties that we have and will have available to right. us in our surrounding communities besides the, the properties that we have here in Peekskill. Okay, there, there are a couple of different approaches. One is the, um, the, the governor uh, has, uh, the state has paid for a consultant to come in and look at the land that Entergy has. Now remember, they can just hold it there for 60 years and they own it. So it's not like you can come in and say you're gonna use it unless they're willing uh, to sell off that piece. But there were three different, different parcels of land that could potentially be developed from their initial review. Um, the, count, the town of Cortland is doing an economic review of other potential properties that are available um, for development. Um, so that may come to play with maybe some availability for media work and, and so on. Uh, which would be very helpful. The county, I think, is going to connect with, uh, from the conversation we had the other night, with Cortland to see what they can do with economic development. And of course, the county has an industrial development agency, uh, which can come in and, um, you know, maybe make some, well, we've had a pilot on the energy plan already for a long period of time, but, but maybe to do the same on some other land. Um, so, you know, there are wonderful possibilities. I would think that Peace Skills should also apply to the Econo Regional Economic Development Council for a proposal, and I don't know what it's, what they could do. Richard Lyons is here. I don't know whether you've had a proposal before the Economic Development Council, but there might be some way. I'm, I'm just thinking of the firehouses mm -hmm. that are there for rehabilitation of old firehouses, um, which would be kind of unique. Uh, we've been putting a lot of money into beer halls around the state of New York with economic development. Uh, so maybe it's time for some firehouses. But I think to apply, and that will be starting to come up soon with the regional uh, councils, I'm assuming it, that will still be in our state budget when we get it passed, hopefully, by April 1st. All right. Uh, let me bring it down to Ben first, <laughs> and then we'll move on. <laughs> Gives me a chance to talk again, Larry. No, uh, <laughs> ser ser serious question. Um, what role can the city target specific industry with with city-owned land that they're looking to redevelop, or does it have to go to a general RFP style mm. request? In other words, like, uh, and I'll give it a specific example, like the Carter property, 13 mm. acres. Mm. Uh, large warehouse spaces, potentially an ideal location for a film production studio facility. Can the city package that? Can they reach out specifically to an industry or do you have to put out one of these general, let's see what comes in the door? We can give it direction, but it, it still has to go out um, like through RFP. Um, most properties like that have to. Um, but we can, we can certainly, you know, encourage what we like to see you know we don't just give it to them tell them you do what the heck you know do whatever you want you know we, we definitely encourage what we would like to see but we do have policy we have to abide by okay see some folks over here um sorry wow i didn't realize how loud this was um so my name is marlon jenkins i'm actually a high school graduate from peekskill and i don't live in peekskill anymore i live in the bronx but um <laughs> I, I'm just going to speak briefly to the REDC thing because we actually, my company, we provide actually broadband in the Bronx. And one of the things we found is we actually just, we were just nominated for a half a million dollar award to bring broadband to lower income communities in the South Bronx. And it was through the REDC grant. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, what I was going to just kind of talk a little fun. bit about <laughs> is, um, I, you know, Colin's one of my good friends and he's on the city council. We were talking about the REDC for Peekskill because I'm actually familiar with the consultants that have done the work in the South Bronx. And I think that's actually a fantastic idea. One of the things we're finding is that broadband can be used not just for infrastructure, as we all know, but to connect the low-income communities also to the local resources, um, whether it's healthcare, education, so on and so forth. 
So my suggestion slash question would be to absolutely consider REDC before the, um, I can't remember what it's called, it's, I think it's a neighborhood development initiative, I think is what it's called, um, to leverage for the entire um, downtown Peace Gill area, to leverage for the arts and education and broadband, and you could probably get a much bigger bang, and then it becomes an investment for the arts, for media, for technology, for healthcare, mm -hmm. for education. Mm -hmm. And I just want to provide my support for everything you're trying to do and, mm -hmm. and find out ways so we can all work together to build more of those opportunities. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. excellent. That's a great thought. Hi, um, my name's Evelyn Waters and I'm a producer. Uh, I think it's all well and good to talk about, um, you know, bringing in the film industry, but I think you have to make sure that everybody is uh, essentially singing from the same song sheet because we, um, I was working with a production last year and it was four months on an independent television series and we were looking at filming in Peekskill and um, we did shoot one day or film one day at HVCAA which was absolutely awesome. That place is incredible uh, inside. Um, absolutely. Um, but when we were... Uh, looking to, to film on the streets of Peekskill and put our permit in, they said, uh, we got word from the police chief that he wasn't, he didn't like the movies. So we went elsewhere. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm here with Ellen Fillo and she's a, the uh, community development in Newburgh. And I think, you know, we actually filmed a large portion of our, our filming there, probably 30 days. Wow. Um, but I think, you know, what do you guys, what can you do to make sure that everybody is with you on this to uh, encourage, to be film friendly and to you know make it easier for producers to bring their productions here. But the first thing I can say is we're not going to make any choices based on what a police chief likes or dislikes. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry that you actually had that experience. You know, uh, um, on behalf of the police, we do have a brand new chief. Um, you have a brand new mayor, you have a brand new council, so you have a brand new group of people to work with. So for your next movie, please come back to Peace Kill. But importantly, that's not a reason to, to prevent anything from happening. Uh, you know, we, we try to work the best we can with, with the businesses or, you know, even the film industries that come to Peekskill. So um, if you decide to come back or anyone out there that's planning on doing any type of film, movie or something in Peekskill, come to the mayor's office now and you'll get a, def a definitely different welcome. <laughs> and, and I'll just say that in New York City, the permitting process is really, really smooth and there's a cooperation between the production companies. Right and the city to ensure that this is, 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 is done pretty much seamlessly. Any other questions There's back there? Back. I think, uh, should I work my way back? There's two, and oh. Okay, oh, um, Mayor, I'm Mary, Mary Foster. Yes, <laughs> uh, two, two quick questions. One, I would like to understand more about whether 5G is in our near future or not in our near future. The discussion was a little unclear. But um, the second question is, there is a lot of opportunity to attract uh, multimedia companies to Peekskill, and it's not always about developing new property, you know, vacant land, but also how one can use existing um, ground floors of, of existing buildings in the downtown or elsewhere, um, or reuse old industrial buildings that we have. And so in doing that, I'd be curious, you know, is there a, a broad repository of the types of companies the city, because we do have our own IDA, that the city could go and target um, in terms of attracting interest and you know, package the city to a group of companies as opposed to just throwing out the net into the ocean and see who floats in. So those are the two questions. I'll respond to the 5G, which is, yeah, it is absolutely um, in our future. The, the, the most complicating part is what's called the last mile. Um, you know, cable companies are, are putting uh, dark fiber and, and uh, conduit in, in the grounds. And, and one of the things I'll, I'll uh, throw out to the mayor is, is a possibility to consider is uh, the city of White Plains, anytime there is a street cut, um, the, uh, whoever does the street cutting in cooperation with uh, the city of White Plains is required to put that conduit down mm -hmm. so that as... Uh, uh, as 5G becomes, you know, goes to the home, it's already there. But it's that, it's that last mile from the street to the house that is, um, that's the most costly and that takes the most time because it's, it's all, you know, it's very labor intensive and getting it done. And there, you know, there are other technologies that are happening also as we speak 
which is uh, wireless, uh, et cetera. So the, the technology is there, and it's what government um, empowers and allows uh, the various utilities to do. Thank you. And as far as the second question goes, um, this is an emerging project right now. Um, I can't say that the IDA has put enti an entire plan on who to go out to, but I personally feel like this may be the first step of that initial plan. So, um, you know, that's something that the city can definitely work towards. But right now, I think this is the first step of that plan. Okay. So I think it's also using the local government, but county government has economic development. Um, I'm not sure that it's all put together at this point, though, it's Joan. Not, uh, well, the, yeah, the, the, the programs are there. The people right. aren't always there. The people, but, there was but, a but change there, of administration, <laughs> so new people will be coming in. Yep. And also Ooh, economic yes. development on a state level. So I think it's pulling yeah. all those people together so everybody, uh, and on the regional basis, so everybody feels like Peak Skills doing this, and we've got to participate in this, and we've got to work together on it, uh, because it's, you know, it's a different, not every community is doing this kind of venture. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think the conference today is, is incredible and shows what's been going on just kind of, kind of behind the scenes and developing. I don't, I don't know whether Louis Lanz is gonna do a kitchen. He's gonna train a whole bunch of Peak Skills students to cook. You gotta eat. I don't know. Artistic. We get a culinary center down here. Is that part of the art? I think it is. We could make great desserts that he can sell in every one of his restaurants. So I'm just thinking for him. But he probably has it in his plans anyway. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leisha Morgan from the Peekskill Film Festival and the Field Library. Um, I just wanted to speak to a couple of points that you were mentioning. Um, we do take on student film. We have an entire uh, third day of nothing but student film from um, Westchester Community College and Jacob Burns and um, all over the world. So that's one component that we do have. This is our third year. Um, it's in the end, end of July. Um, I just wanted to mention that there, there has to be a synergy between the state, the city, nonprofit, and businesses in peak scale. And I think that AIM is mm -hmm. a really a important really part of that. And I really thank Ben and the whole committee for that. I just wanted to ask Mayor Rainey, um, what do you think, um, and I'm born and raised here um, and peak scale schools and came back um, in the late 90s. What do you think this administration is going to do differently than other administrations didn't do? Um, because we've had the Peekskill Arts Alliance you know, since uh, Artist Lofts um, in bringing the film industry that, that didn't, w didn't happen with um, the artists before. Because I think this is a completely different group of peak, uh, people and businesses, and I'm really happy with what's going on and the way that you're answering questions and having meetings. Um, but I just really want to continue what's going on, and how do you think it's going to be different than it was before? Well, first I'll say, uh, Ben Green has had me in about 17 meetings <laughs> in about six days, so I think I'm doing my part. Uh, but this administration that you have here now, this, uh, and, I, and I, I, I can proudly say that this administration isn't just an administration of, of, of politicians. You have an elected official. You have, you have seven elected officials of people who are actually involved. Um, so when we say we support the artist initiative, we don't go to a council meeting and say we support the artist initiative. We actually come out and push the artist initiative. We go to different places and promote the artist initiative. We were in different interviews with people in, I mean, I was in, in um, uh, what is it? Uh, the, 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 and, uh, I can't even think of the name of the place. The, uh, <laughs> Over the bridge, though, I was over the bridge at a at a at a convention with a lot of the um you know you know the retired veterans. West Point, there we go. Goodness, <laughs> Jeez, I can't. I've been sleeping, dreaming of arts media. Like I can't get anything out of my mouth. But I was over at West Point just about a month ago, just talking with some of the veterans over there and and, and a few mayors from you know other counties, and just in conversation. Listen, have you guys been to Peekskill? If not. 
the perfect time to come would be the weekend of March 24th, you know? When I'm doing these things at the schools and I speak to the students at the schools, you know what, you guys? You all should be around Peace Guild. I have a text group of friends that I grew up with. When I told them what's happened in Peace Guild, I can't curse. But they said, no way, you know? It's like, that's part of Peace Guild. But what we're trying to do as a council is actually be involved in the helping, not just, not just say that we're gonna help. We're gonna push ourselves to be involved. We support the initiative by promoting the initiative, anything that we can do, but I'm an artist myself. So it's, it's, it's imperative to me that these type of things get brought to our youth. I think that the future, as the future gets a grasp of this, this won't be an initiative anymore. It'll actually be something that's occurring every year in peak scale. It'll be, a, it'll be, It'll be almost a norm to say, because you have so much creativity here in the city of Peekskill. And I can say to my council that are here, keep doing what you do. All right, we, we are, um, we are. Well, you got, you wants, got one more over there. He wants there. to defend uh, himself. Uh, why don't I take two more? <laughs> all, right, all right, yeah, because I definitely make sure Brian gets his. Hi there, my name is Brian Handler. Um, in 2008, I started at Blue Sky Studios, which is the animation studio behind Ice Age, Rio, Peanuts, Ferdinand. Uh, on January 4th, 2009, we moved to Connecticut because of $15 million. That left four floors of Westchester One in White Plains empty, as well as all the staff mm -hmm. that was there to support our facilities. Those jobs went away. So my question is, how do we compete with somebody like Connecticut, who's got this big package, and ultimately, it changed our quality of life. I don't have the ability to walk someplace. I can't go to Ramanesque. Nope, I gotta drive to Armonk to go buy food and I can't walk to work anymore. So there's gotta be a part of a narrative that just goes along with the tax breaks. And what is our narrative? If we can't compete with the money of Connecticut, what can we say to go along with the money we can give? It's kind of a problem that we deal with every year in our budget. Uh, budgeting, I don't, you know, Westchester does different things probably than the state of New York. We've, we've put a lot of um, effort into film and TV tax credits, uh, which has been our big thing. And that's a hard fight to get it going. And we have, we have taken people from California and Connecticut and other places because we have the tax credit. Uh, the upstate New Yorkers are not really so pleased with it because they don't seem to feel the benefits. Um, so, you know, it's always a tug of war, it, you know, it, it, it's always about money and it's not that we don't want you to be here, we do, uh, but we're always in competition in different categories with different states and um, sometimes we don't do so well. Some people have suggested that, you know, sometimes they don't even work. I mean, people, they look at other things, uh, proximity to New York City, which we have, which Connecticut maybe doesn't. Uh, transportation issues, maybe being near major airports. I, you just, and train service and so on that sometimes really adds to the benefit for a company. Um, so, you know, I'm, I did, don't want you to have moved. Uh, I'm sorry you did, and, and maybe there'll be an opportunity again. But that's always our give and take with the budget, it is a very difficult thing as we're dealing with how do we deal with $165 billion and provide health care and education and everything else. And let me just so. ask this quick, quick. Are you a post-production facility? Or? They are full. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, I mean, mm -hmm. the one, one observation I'll make is that the, uh, the, the state uh, film and television tax incentive program is a very well you know, allocated program. It's at $420 million a year. Um, it doesn't make it, in terms of the rebate, the, the greatest rebate in the country. It makes it one of the best rebates in the country. Mm -hmm. And it's been calibrated in such a fashion that it's a, the rebate is against below the line costs. Larry, and that can I? Yeah. I, I was the commissioner of economic development and I did that deal. You did that deal? I did that so deal. There's somebody I did that deal. So um, Sorry. I, Sorry, Joe. I, I will tell you a few things. It was, you know, Connecticut's film tax credit is competitive, New York's film tax credit is competitive with Connecticut. What Connecticut has in addition to the film tax credits are its other economic development incentive programs that we combined. Uh, we had uh, other tax credits that are broad-based tax credits, so uh, Blue Sky received both film tax credits plus 
regular tax credits plus um, some energy incentives through the Connecticut Clean Energy Fund, oh, wow. plus some job training funds that were, that were grants. So it's, so it's, Connecticut has a bigger, broader economic development uh, package. And that was a, uh, and, and I think the other thing that helped was that it was, it was literally across the street. You know, it's, it's King right. Street. So on one side of the road, you're in Westchester, and on the other side of the road, you're in Greenwich. I, I don't know if that space had not been available, that it wouldn't have, because when we were negotiating, those were, those were what, you know, it was, it was important that it be close to the uh, two train stations, because at the time, a number of uh, Blue Sky employees commuted from Brooklyn up to White Plains. So it was not just the film tax credits. Right, it sounds like Connecticut has a more, its, it's film credit is comparative to New York's, but it's more, uh, there are other types of credits that attach that they, to it that, that New York just combined. simply doesn't have. But New York may not be interested in having it right. because New York has been so successful with what it does have. Mm -hmm. Literally, the capacity in New York in terms of sound stages is completely full. If they put yep. up additional five or 10 or 15 sound stages tomorrow, they will be filled. So it's calibrated in a fashion that is working for New York. But I'd love to talk to you after this, uh, after this uh, panel discussion. Louis? Thanks, Larry. Hi, Louis Lanza. Yay! <laughs> um, great job, guys. Incredible day. Uh, my 10-year-old, almost 11-year-old son, I said, you're coming here today. This is ground zero for multimedia. And in a few years, when he takes over the uh, businesses, hopefully sooner or later, um, <laughs> he can say he was here. So, and yes, Sandy, we have an idea. A group of people okay. have an idea. We've talked to the mayor and other people about doing a food service program Great. in one of the firehouses by the high school and oh. teaching these kids uh, a trade that, you know, not everybody has to go to college or can go to college. And this past week, we met with Westchester Community College, the mm -hmm. IDA, and the, and the chamber, and we talked about bringing a hospitality course or two to the WCC right here, which is great. And, and from, from there, these kids could get a scholarship to go to the one down county and learn the trade. That being said, maybe the firehouse that we're looking at, we could put a arts and media high school program together mm -hmm. on one of the floors and a, and a restaurant on the second floor and have a real cultural center for these kids. So and that's that collaboration, Lou. There that, you go. That would be something. <laughs> Get a list of volunteers, because Ben Green's going to be bored after tonight, so he's, <laughs> he needs another project. <laughs> so. But thank you very much, and an incredible day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I think this has been, I know this has been a terrific discussion. I apologize to anyone who has a question out there and I didn't get to you, uh, but we did run out of time and absent, well, I'm not gonna say that, we did run out of time at this point. I know from my conversations with, with Ben, this is gonna be the first of many. Mm -hmm. we are, the aim is not ending today or tomorrow. <laughs> aim is going on. And I wanna give, uh, I wanna say how, from my perspective, and I, I preface my comments with, I'm not a Peekskill resident, I don't work in Peekskill, my, uh, our offices are up in Albany, and we work in the city and in points in between. I am extraordinarily impressed by what Peekskill is doing. Mm -hmm. This is a Absolutely. real, this yeah. is a city that could be proud. I want to thank our panelists. You guys are awesome. And ultimately, you guys are the ones who are going to make the difference here. So with that, thank you all. And have a great day. I, I want to thank Larry Shearer again, but also Mike Miner, who's uh, really donated his time to do a four-camera shoot here today. And Les Bloom.